Motivation, Chapter 8. <clears throat> I have no idea why I picked <laughs> this slide. Self-enhancement is a motivation to view oneself positively. Research reveal, reveal, reveals that people apparently have a strong need to view themselves in a positive light. Self-esteem is the positivity of your overall evaluation of yourself. In a study done in Canada in 1999, Heine and colleagues found that 93% of European Canadians had self-esteem scores that were above the midpoint of the scale. Self-serving biases are tendencies for people to exaggerate how good they think that they actually are. And of course, this is a man with a, a spare tire and he looks at himself and all he's looking at are his muscles, which possibly, and he, he's got hair. <laughs> Heine, of course, is the author of your book. A downward social comparison is when we compare ourselves to someone who is worse off than us. We are seeking to form a favorable comparison that casts our own performance in a positive light. When a setback occurs, the individual can focus on and perhaps exaggerate how good they are at something unrelated to their setback, compensating for the pain of failure. They can self-enhance by recruiting other kinds of positive thoughts. Discounting is re reducing the perceived importance of the domain in which an individual performed badly. People might attribute the cause of their actions to something outside themselves, external attribution, in contrast to an internal attribution, where they see the cause as within themselves. Some people dis dissipate their personal fa failures by basking in the reflected glory of a successful group they identify with. And, of course, this is known as basking. Research seems to show that European Americans, even at a young age, tend to maintain fairly high self-enhancing motivations. Tropp and Wright in 2003 found that, that preschool and elementary school European American children chose self-enhancing images at 92% compared to a similar group of Mexican Americans who chose the positive uh, uh, self-enhancing images uh, at only 82%. When Freiburg and Marcus in 2003 looked at a group of elementary school Native Americans, they found that less than half made positive statements about themselves. The authors saw these results as consistent with the understanding that Native Americans are less independent, uh, and independence is related to self-enhancement. This did not prove true of the collectivistic Maori of, of New Zealand, according to Harrington and Liu in 2002. This did not prove true of African Americans. Uh, this is, uh, is according to Major et al. in 1998. This did not prove true of Israeli Druze, and this is according to Kerman in 2001. And you may wonder who the Druze are. The Druze are, are kind of a cross between, their religion is kind of a cross between Christianity and Judaism. Uh, they're considered a, a, a Christian group by... <laughs> by the, the Jewish people, and they're considered a Jewish group by by the Muslim people. It's really kind of curious. Uh, but there are hundreds of thousands of uh, these individuals living in the M Middle East, and as you can see, this is what they look like. Uh, this is not, uh, pr uh, this did not prove true of Asian Indians, and that's according to Josh and Carter in two, uh, 2013. 93% of European Canadians had high self-esteem, and according that's, of course, according to the, uh, uh, to the uh, author. 55% of Japanese Canadians had a high self-esteem, according to the author. Again, of course, remember that Heine is, is uh, married to a Japanese woman. Masses of research show that Americans find success more memorable, probably because they think more about them. And Japanese tend to find failures more memorable because they think more about them. And this is according to Hamura, Ham, Hamamura and Heine in 2007, 
and Kitayama and Matsumoto. Oh, I'm sorry, Kitayama et al. in 1997. After failing at a task, North Americans tend to discount the importance of the task. Japanese will view the task as even more important than it was before. Americans tend to bask in the reflected glory of their sports teams, while the Japanese are more likely to be critical of their local team as uh, the opposition. In other words, if uh, home field advantage doesn't work in Japan because the Japanese are, are uh, more negative about their own team than they are about the uh, competing team. Heine and others have speculated that East Asians are just as motivated as Westerners to evaluate themselves positively, merely as their group selves instead of their individual selves. East Asians like themselves as much as Westerners, but seem to be more self-critical of their competence. One of the phenomena of Craigslist and eBay is the endowment effect. Westerners tend to value something more after they own it, uh, which makes them inflate the prices they are asking for their junk. We see the opposite effect of East Asians. They are more likely to uh, uh, to ask a lower price than uh, they actually think than, than it may be worth because they think that because they had it, it's not worth as much as, uh, as a new one or, or a used one from somebody else. Miller and her colleagues in 1997 and again in 2002 looked at children's stories in the United States and Taiwan. They found a marked difference. American stories focused the children's attention on their strengths, while Taiwanese stories focused on areas that needed correcting. European American parents viewed self-esteem as central to child uh, rearing. Uh, Taiwanese parents expressed the belief that too much self-esteem can lead to frustration when things aren't working out well for the children. Research shows that the notion of individual selves didn't emerge in Western literature until the 12th century. At this point, the Christian concept of the Last Judgment changed from being an issue of the salvation of collectives to the salvation of individual souls. With the Protestant Reformation in the 16th century, many Protestant sects maintained a belief in predestination or the idea that one's fate was determined before birth. This gave people a great drive to enhance themselves as that proved that they were uh, one of God's chosen people. So the, only, so the best way to prove yourself as a person chosen by God was to be successful. So they sought wealth. Face is a strong Eastern idea that barely registers among Westerners. Face has been defined as the amount of social value others give you if you live up to the standards associated with your position. The higher your social position, the greater the amount of face available to you. If others grant you face, you'll enjoy all the perquisites uh, that come with the uh, enhanced status and power. One characteristic of face is that it's, it's more uh, easily lost than gained. The amount of face an individual has access to is determined by position, thus increasing face can only be increased with promotion. While face is difficult to enhance, face is lost whenever individuals fail to live up to the standards of their roles. Face is always vulnerable, and because others determine a person's face, people must count on the goodwill of others to be able to maintain their face. Since face is so easily lost, one strategy is for people to adopt a cautious approach and try to ensure that they are not acting in a way that might lead others to reject them. This approach is known as prevention orientation, being defensive and cautious. Prevention orientation is contrasted with promotion orientation, where the individual is more concerned with advancing themselves and aspiring for gains. Prevention seeks to avoid bad things, while promotion seeks to secure good things. Canadian and Japanese participants were given a faux test that they failed. Everybody failed this test. They were given a chance to either work on their problems or focus on their successes in the test. Canadian participants chose to focus on the things they did well, promotion focus. 
In the same study, the Japanese participants maintained a more prevention focus. They were more interested in working on things they did poorly, apparently so they could improve themselves and be less likely to fail in the future. This self-improvement motivation, a desire to seek out potential weaknesses and work on correcting them, is, str is a strong motivation in East Asian contexts. Eastern and Western cultures deal with strengths and weaknesses differently. East Asian parents are more likely to call their children's attention to their weaknesses. Western parents direct their children's attention to their strengths. As East Asians have increased their fortunes, they have become big consumers of brand name luxury goods. Purchasing and displaying brand name goods can increase your face. A key motivation for these acquisitions is to achieve social recognition. In 1904-1905, Max Weber, who was a sociologist, printed a controversial but influential series of essays entitled The Protestant Ethic and the Spirit of Capitalism. Weber attempted to determine how capitalism was able to emerge from the traditional economics of medieval Europe. Before Weber, the prime social idea came from Karl Marx. Marx felt that capitalism was a result of surplus capital that came from the shift from an agricultural econ economy to an industrial economy. Marx also felt that religion was being used by governments to control the people. Weber, Weber viewed capitalism as a product of people's deriving meaning from a particular cultural context. Capitalism grew out of a belief system that was rooted in a number of cultural ideas that began emerging in the 16th and 17th centuries in Western Europe and in North America. The ideas that became foundation for capitalism were ones that grew out of the Protestant Reformation. Protestants emphasized literacy training more than Catholics, so the people would be able to read the Bible for themselves. Until the 1960s, um, uh, Catholic Mass, the their religious um, undertaking. Uh, if you go to church, you would hear Mass in uh, in uh, uh, Catholic church, and, and you would hear a um, a, a sermon in, in a Protestant uh, uh, church. But Mass uh, used to be celebrated only in Latin. So if you were French, um, you wouldn't understand what they were saying. If you were German, then you wouldn't understand what they were saying. If you were English, it, since it was in Latin, unless you spoke Latin, of course, uh, then uh, you, wouldn't be, you wouldn't be able to understand what the, the priest was saying. So the Protestants started preaching uh, in the language that, uh, of the nation. Uh, so in France, they spoke in Fran French. In Germany, they spoke in German. In the United States and, and England, they spoke in English. So Protestants have always conducted their ceremonies, their sermons, in the language of the people that they were talking to. Catholics, until the 1960s, it was always in Latin. You know, you could never go to a church where they were, they, they might have, say something at the beginning and something at the end, but you'd have no idea what they were talking about in, in between, unless you spoke Latin. The end of, and so... This was a huge difference between, between Protestants and Catholics. Uh, one of the other ideas of Catholicism uh, is that the priest is the intermediary between the people and with God. Uh, so he's the intermediary. So he's, uh, and that's one of the reasons why he spoke in Latin, because that was the language of God. But Protestants, of course, and one of the reasons Protestants became Protestants, and one of the reasons why they uh, are referred to as the protesting people, was because uh, they decided that uh, that people needed to make decisions on their own, dealing with their religion. So they came up with uh, with uh, they they rebelled against the Catholic Church, uh, and one of the reasons they did that is because. The sermons were delivered in a language that most people didn't understand. And that's where the Protestant religion came from. And this happened, the Protestant Reformation, as I said earlier, uh, occurred in the 16th century. That's the 1500s. 
uh, at the end of the 1500s. So the Protestants have only been around for uh, four or 500 years. Uh, Catholicism has been around for 2,000 years. The individualized, if, uh, an example, another example of a religion that is relatively new would be uh, the Church of Latter-day Saints has only been around for about 200 years, a little over 200 years, uh, a little under 200 years, actually. Uh, so there you go. So, you know, religions aren't, they're not all tens of thousands of years old. As a matter of fact, there are very few that, uh, religions today that are that are older than a couple thousand years. Judaism may be, you know, 2,500, 3,000 years old. But uh, Christianity, of course, has only been around uh, for a little over 2,000 years. And the Protestant Reformation, as I said before, took place in the 16th century. So that's all the religion I'm going to teach you today. <laughs> I hope, maybe. The individualized relation that formed between each person and God has been argued to be central to the blossoming of individualism that emerged during the Reformation and continues to influence much of Western society today. And what we're talking about in Western society is primarily this Protestant work ethic. But of course, there are a lot of Westerners that, uh, that are Catholic as well. Uh, and the Catholic Church has evolved uh, differently. They now do their sermons in, in uh, the language of the nation that they're, they're dealing with. Uh, but uh, until the, the 1960s, it was always in Latin. Martin Luther, the founder of Protestantism, proposed that each individual had a calling. That is a unique God-given purpose to fulfill during his or her mortal existence. We all have a calling, according to the Protestants. The idea was that uh, we are all God's servants in the world, and that we are uh, each given a specific duty or job to take care of while we tend the planet. God gives each individual the unique skills and capabilities needed to fulfill their calling, and it is incumbent upon the individuals to discover their calling. The highest moral duty that individuals were believed to have was to serve God well by working hard at their calling. Luther was able to imbue daily labor with a spiritual significance that had traditionally been reserved for religious activities such as prayer and ritual. Now this gets kind of interesting. He said taking a drink. This gets kind of interesting because if you look at, um, at the world before the Protestant Reformation, one of the things that was happening was that the church was trying to tell people that they needed to be as religious as they possibly could. And this went to an extreme, this went to extremes. Uh, the church was the largest landowner in Europe, uh, the Catholic Church. And then, you know, there, there was a Protestant Reformation and certain kings became Protestant kings. Uh, certain monarchical uh, structures became uh, more Protestant, uh, or they just decided that they did, they wanted to kick the church out of their countries. Uh, so what they would do, they would go in and they would seize all the, the church's property. Uh, they would take what they wanted and maybe give uh, small parts to the to the back to the church. And, and this happened all over was happening all over Europe. Um, and the idea was that, that people needed to be as religious as possible, so you needed to think about God, and you needed to be good, and you needed to do what the church told you to do on a on a, on a, a minute-by-minute minute basis. Uh, that was the idea. And then, of course, uh, the Protestant Reformation came, uh, came to be, and at that point, they needed people to uh, the church, the Protestant Church uh, needed people to uh, to continue to work, of course, uh, but now they they convinced people that what they needed to do was to find their calling and work as hard as they possibly could at their calling. 
So whereas before the Protestant Reformation, uh, the uh, people were supposed to think about God and they were th supposed to be good all the time and do exactly what the church told them to do. Uh, that's remember I told you they, they, uh, the f only the middle of the uh, of the of the mass was in Latin. At the beginning they were telling people what to do, and at the end they were telling people what to do. Uh, as far as uh, using their language, and here I am. I'm teaching you religion again. I'm sorry. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so now you could be a good you could be a good Protestant uh, uh, Christian by uh, by doing what you were supposed to be doing. If you're a farmer, working really hard to be a farmer. If you were a preacher, you would be working really hard to be a preacher. If you were a businessman, you were working very hard to be a businessman because this was your calling. Because Protestants came to work uh, to view work as a spiritual task, they wished to avoid debasing it by holding a casual or unprofessional attitude. Protestants felt that people should take their work very seriously. And this was kind of different from... Uh, from the Catholic Church, I mean, they didn't really imbue work with any spirituality. It was just something you did so that you could think about God uh, as much as you possibly needed to. It was believed that God would not reward those who were doomed to burn in hell. So any, any sign of material successes, a success was perceived as evidence that one was one of the elect. In other words, you were going to go to heaven because you made a lot of money or because you accumulated a lot of land. Any accumulated wealth was to be reinvested to further one's efforts and to accumulate even more wealth and evidence of one's status among the elect. So people started collect, or, uh, started uh, uh, making more and more money. And the more money you made, the more money you put back into your, into your businesses. And this is one of the reasons why we suddenly have these huge companies um, be, mainly because not only were they making a lot of money, but they were also putting their money back into the company. Uh, they were reinvesting it in themselves. So if they started out with one factory, all of a sudden they had three factories, then five factories, then nine factories, then, then 24 factories. They were putting their money back into the, the company. And that's, that was part of this, uh, Protestant, uh, work ethic. Modern capitalism, as Weber viewed it, uh, was thus concerned with the accumulation of wealth for its own sake and not for the sake of material pleasures that it bought. The idea wasn't that you were making money so you could have a good time. The idea was that you were making money so that you could show people that you were, lo you were um, uh, appreciated by God more than anybody else. A recent analysis found that Protestants and people living in Protestant societies were generally uh, more generally consider the prospect of being unemployed as more of a blow to their well-being than non-Protestants living in non-Protestant societies. And this is according to Van Hoom and Maysland in 2013. So there is this huge embarrassment about being uh, unemployed. In the early 21st century, a study revealed that Protestant nations were far more industrialized than their Catholic counterparts, and religious differences accounted for much of that. And that's according to Cavalcante et al. in 2007. A degree of individualism exists in Protestant countries compared to other countries. Uh, the six most individualistic countries in the world are largely Protestant, whereas the least individualistic Western societies are largely Catholic. Countries dominated by various Asian religions also tend to score low in individualism. Pronounced differences in embracing an intrinsic work ethic were observed between Western European Catholics and mainstream Pro Protestants as evident in a measure of work values. And that's according to to Georgi and Marsh in 1990. The Protestant ethic has been associated with negative attitudes toward laziness and being overweight, and this is according to Quinn and Crocker in 1999. McClellan in 1961 found that Protestant parents expected their children to become self-reliant 
at an earlier age compared with Catholic parents. McClellan in 1961 investigated the stories written by young boys and found that those written by German Protestants had more evidence of strong achievement motivations than those written by German Catholics. Now this is a really kind of an interesting picture because um, Germany was primarily destroyed and they had to rebuild the whole country after World War II. So one of the things that happened was there are two uh, official religions in uh, in uh, Germany. One is the Catholic Church and the other one is the L Lutheran Church. Actually, they, they call it Kirch. They call it, it's a Protestant. It's a Protestant church uh, idea. So when they rebuilt all of these towns and they rebuilt all these cities, there, had, there were always two churches. And this is really kind of interesting. This is the Catholic Church right here and this is the Lutheran Church right here. And the reason uh, normally uh, one church will be at the end of, uh, at the one uh, side of town, and the other one will be at the opposite uh, side of town. So if you're, if you're a Lutheran, if you're going to the Protestant church, you turn left at the, at the corner, and if you're Catholic, you turn right and go to the end of the street. Now, this is the Catholic cathedral, and this is the uh, Lutheran church. Lutherans are really kind of interesting. They're, uh, I used to live in Nebraska. And as you're driving, and there's a lot of Lutherans in in, uh, in uh, Nebraska. There are a lot of Protestant, uh, uh, Methodists, and and Presbyterians and Episcopalians too. But uh, you, you see a lot of Lutherans because uh, Lutheran is the religion of the Scandinavian countries, and there are a lot of Scandinavians in in Nebraska. Anyway, so when you're driving around uh, uh, Nebraska and you see a church. If it's got a really tall spire like this, you know it's a Lutheran church. And if it doesn't have a tall spire, it's, it could be any other denomination. Uh, but uh, Lutheran churches always have really tall spires on them, which is kind of fun. Uh, uh, I live in a small town. It's a lost nation. And the three major uh, churches in town, one is my wife's Presbyterian church, and then not a block away is the, is the Lutheran church. And then down on the corner uh, is the uh, Catholic church. So, you know, if you're a Catholic, you go to the Catholic church. Lutheran, you go to the Lutheran church. And if you're not one of those two guys, if you're a Methodist or a, a Presbyterian, you go to the Presbyterian church. But look, I was driving down the street the other day, and I looked, and <laughs> the Presbyterian church and the Lutheran church both have spires on them. But the, the Lutheran Church is just a little bit taller than, than the Presbyterian Church, as if the closer to heaven, you know, the more likely that you're going to get to go to heaven. Really kind of interesting. Anyway, this is all, all has to do with religion. If you guys don't care, you don't care. But uh, the idea is that Protestants have this strange work, work ethic thing. Ullman, Tannenbaum, and Barr in 2011 primed a group of Americans and group of Canadians with salvation words or neutral words and then gave them a task to do. Americans who were primed with salvation words worked harder on the task than those who were primed with neutral words. Am I going to talk about the myth of Sisyphus? Okay, this is a myth of Sisyphus. Uh, Sisyphus is a, a, a Greek uh, myth, is in Greek mythology. Uh, Sisyphus did something I can't remember. He did something against the gods. Gods told him not the gods, the Greek gods told him not to do it, and he did it anyway. And so his punishment was for him to roll this ball up a uh, steep mountain, and it was really hard work. And and by about the time he got to the top the ball would always roll all the way back down. And then he had to go back down and start rolling the ball up. And so this was his punishment. This, is, this went on for his entire time in wherever he was, I guess. Uh, anyway, that's the myth of Sisyphus is uh, futility. It uh, has to do with futility. So you go against the gods, then you, maybe you're going to have to uh, roll a ball up a hill for the rest of your life. That was the idea. That's the myth of Sisyphus. And actually, I have that somewhere. There it is. Oh, it's the myth of Sisyphus by Albert Camus. 
Uh, the American results indicate that notions of hard work and salvation are implicitly linked for Americans. This pattern occurred regardless of whether or not the American participants were religious, providing some evidence for uh, Weber's uh, claims that ideas about predestination become secularized and thus part of the American uh, cultural fabric. And of course, that is probably true to some extent. Uh, if you are an American, you have this idea that you need to work hard and it will be rewarded. That's part of the American myth has to do with hard work and you will, will always be successful if you work hard. The Canadian participants did not work any harder than uh, when primed with ideas about salvation, suggesting that an implicit link between salvation and working was not evident as far as Canadians were concerned. It was evident to, uh, to Americans, uh, but not to Canadians. Now, you would think Canadians and Americans are just about the same, but the reality is we've had a different uh, educational system for an extended length of time. Uh, the uh, American uh, educational system um, had to adapt to all those immigrants coming in at the end of the 19th century, beginning of the 20th century, and Canada didn't really have that much of an influx. Uh, their educational system has always been the English educational system, so it always reflected that, uh, that type of, of, of education. The uh, United States, not so much. Um, even, even to this day, in England and in, in Canada and Australia, uh, there's two types of schools. There are private schools and there are public schools. And um, the idea is that if you've got money, then you go to a private school, which they call public schools for no reason whatsoever. And it, otherwise, you go to a, a, a regular school or, you know, a, what we would call a public school. The idea is that if you go to a public school, then you're educated uh, to become a worker. And if you go to, to a private school, then potentially you're, you're being educated to be a leader. That's the idea there. Um, we tried to kind of follow, follow the same uh, pattern in the United States, but we've gone well beyond that now because we had to educate all of these people that obviously weren't going to become leaders. Leaders because you can't have that many leaders uh, in a, such a small area. Uh, so uh, we, we do have private schools in the United States. I went to a private college. Uh, the idea is that uh, um, not, it isn't that they're going to become leaders. They're just different types of liberal arts. Uh, a good example would be in the United States. The, the educational idea is that uh, if you go to one of the Ivy League schools, which are all private schools, all the Ivy League schools or private schools, <clears throat> that it, those are, are um, uh, train you to become leaders. And I don't know if you agree with that, but uh, whenever you're looking at, at somebody's uh, resume or their CV, their uh, curriculum vitae, um, if, if they went to Harvard or Yale or, or Princeton or Dartmouth or Cornell, uh, Columbia, uh, University of Pennsylvania. Uh, if you went to any of those schools, of course, then you uh, um, it marks you as, as as having a better education. That's the idea, anyway. And of course, we have other schools that are are uh, have just the same as good a reputation. Stanford, for example, um, Duke's reputation is getting much much better. Uh, University of Chicago. Uh, there's there's a, a number of schools around the country there that are public schools. Uh, uh, Berkeley is another one uh, that uh, uh, train people, even though they're state schools, uh, they they there's they uh, still train people to be to be leaders. University of Chicago is private, by the way. Not that that's important. Okay, now that I've explained all of these things that you didn't care about. <laughs> okay, so the Canadian participants, because their educational system is different, they don't have this imbued form of uh, that you have to work hard, and if you work hard, then you can become anything you want to be. Uh, the Canadians don't have that idea. 
Cohen, Kim, and Hudson induced male American Protestants, Jews, and Catholics to imagine their sisters in sexual situations. They then had them do sculptures. Now, this is in 2014, okay? In 2014, they, they took three different religious groups, Protestants, Jews, and Catholics. They were all male. They wanted them to imagine their sisters in a sexual situation, and then they had them do sculptures. The Protestants were judged as working harder on their sculptures than the Jews or the Catholics, or the Protestants not primed with depravity about their sisters. The researchers concluded that it was the depraved thoughts that induced the Protestants to work harder. They were punishing themselves. They were trying to, uh, uh, to uh, get over the fact that uh, they had thought of their sisters in a sexual situation. They were punishing themselves in essence. Uh, they were working harder. They were, um, uh, it was a form of retribution. The uh, Jewish and the Catholic uh, males uh, didn't work harder on their sculptures because they don't have the same ideas. This, this need to work hard uh, to uh, punish yourself for something that you've done. We can see the world is fixed and beyond our control to change the entity theory of the world, or we can think of the world as flexible and responsive to our efforts to change it, and this is known as the incremental theory of the world. Uh, Rothbaum, Weiss, and Snyder, 1982, proposed that there are two ways to gain control of your life. People will achieve a sense of primary control by striving to shape existing realities to fit their pre, uh, perceptions, goals, or wishes. That's primary control. And pr uh, primary control also goes uh, under the related name, internal locus of control, influence, and, ag uh, and agency. So if you have control over things, that's known as, if you feel like you have control over, over your life, then that's primary control or the internal locus of control. People achieve a sense of secondary control when they attempt to align themselves with existing realities, leaving the realities unchanged but exerting control over the psychological impact of these realities. Secondary control, also known as adjustment, is related to the construct of an external locus of control. Your desires and goals adjust themselves to what your environment is most likely to provide. A good example of this would be people that decide that they want to become Republicans because the Republicans are in power, uh, So, and they will do what they need to do. They will change the way that they think so that they can become more powerful, so that they can exert control over things. Uh, but they still feel that it is this idea that they need to be a Republican. That is the external locus of control, if that makes any sense. Weiss, Rothbaum, and Blackburn in 1984 see many socializing experiences in Japan that lead Japanese to be more comfortable with engaging in secondary control strategies. Japanese infants spend uh, much more time in contact with their mothers and thus learn to adjust themselves to what their mothers are doing. And you would think, um, you know, in, in the United States, we don't actually do this. We, we let our kids play by themselves. We don't have to always have a uh, hold of them. But you can imagine that uh, if you needed to do some work uh, and you needed to hold your baby at the same time, fairly quickly the baby would uh, learn to adjust itself to not move around, not, not be a, a troublemaker uh, if uh, they were in that kind of a situation. Japanese workers change jobs far less frequently than their Western counterparts, and it is not uncommon for workers to be promised lifetime employment on a system ensuring their employees learn to adjust themselves to whatever demands the company places on them. So they will do what they are instructed to do. In a Japanese and American study where workers were asked to recount when they had been helped and when they had helped others, the Americans were better able to recall when they had influenced others. And this is according to Morling, Kitayama, and Miyamoto in 2002. The Japanese recalled far more times when they were assisted than when they helped someone else. 
Um, I'm showing you this picture for a couple different reasons. One, it's in J Japan. The other reason is so that you can see just how crowded it is in J Japan. This is a subway train, and as you can see, everybody's standing up. Everybody is pressed right up against each other. And if you look at people's faces, nobody's looking at anyone else. This is the way it works in Japan. You may be, and, and actually this guy's, he's touching this lady's arm. This guy's front is touching this lady's uh, back. Uh, of course, he's not looking at her. Uh, this guy's, each of his shoulders is touching a different person. There's somebody behind him that's touching him. You know, this is just the way it is in Japan. Um, it's that crowded. <laughs> it's that ridiculously crowded. There are uh, There is little emphasis on making choices in life for people from India. Making choices seems to be more difficult for Indians than for Americans. Indians take significantly more time to make choices than do Americans, and that's because they're not practiced at doing it. They go to the store, there's only one kind of butter. They go to the store, uh, they only have one choice of milk. Um, it's, they don't have to make decisions. They take whatever they can find. Asian Indians uh, don't respond as negatively when they are deprived of the opportunity to choose when compared with Americans. Asian Indians and people from numerous other non-Western cultures also indicate that they have less free choice in their lives compared with North Americans. Choices do not appear to play as large a part in the lives of Asian Indians as North Americans. The more important to the, uh, the important the action, the more likely Americans were to identify it as a personal choice, whereas for Asian Indians, the more important the action, the less likely they were to view it as a personal choice. When Americans are given an opportunity to choose something, they almost always select the option they prefer. The link between preferences and choices isn't as tight among Asian Indians. They are less likely to choose their favorite option, as interesting as that is. In the United States, I drive a Mazda because I think Mazdas are really good cars. Uh, if I didn't have a choice between a Mazda, let's see. I bought a truck, um, and I wasn't, I've had Dodges before, but, um, and I've always dropped the transmission in them for one reason or another. I've had two Dodges, and I had to replace both transmissions in both of those cars. But when I had a, 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 a Dodge truck, when I came across a Dodge truck with only 30,000 miles on it, and it was 23 years old, I decided, hey, this sounds like a pretty good deal. It's only got 30,000 miles. Maybe I, can, maybe I can get all the use out of it that I need before I drop the transmission in this, in this guy. So I, I bought a Dodge. I don't know why I'm talking about that. Uh, oh, we're talking about choice. In learned helplessness, an individual feels that he or she is unable to control or avoid unpleasant events and the person will suffer from stress and potentially depression. A study by Ontgen and Seligman in uh, 1990 found that East Berliners showed more signs of learned helplessness than the people on the other side of the wall in West Berlin. And actually, uh, I, was in West, I was in East Berlin um, in 1980, 1980, 19, yeah, that's not right, 1981, 1982. Um, when they were still in East Berlin and the North uh, and in West Berlin, and I had to go through Checkpoint Charlie in order to get into East Berlin, uh, and both times I took my kids. Is that right? No. No, I only took my kids in '82. The interesting thing about Berlin, and I, you may not find this as interesting as I do. Interesting thing about Berlin is that's the first Chinese food I ever had <laughs> was in Berlin. Snibe and Marcus in 2005 argue that upper middle class Americans are raised to favor choices and to express themselves through their choices. They learn to respond quite negatively when they believe that they do not have any choice in a situation. 
Working class Americans grew up learning that much of, the, of what people encounter in life is beyond their control and that a good way to maintain one's independence is to emphasize one's integrity and resilience during tough times. But Ash's work in 1962 showed that Americans were more likely to conform to social pressure than not. 75% of Ash's American subjects conformed on at least one of the 12 trials. And of course, if you remember, um, uh, conformity is common. Uh, if you remember Ash's experiment, he had like seven people in a room. Uh, all of them were Confederates except one person. And so they, they made obviously um, incorrect choices, uh, the six people, uh, because that was part of the experiment. And they wanted to see how long it would take the, uh, uh, the subject to uh, conform uh, to these wrong ideas. And you can tell which ones are the, uh, this guy right here is the, uh, is the subject in this one. You can see the look on his face. These guys are just looking, but this guy, number six, he's the one that is the subject. Ash conducted other experiments dealing with conformity and found that there are several consequences to not conforming. People might laugh at you. Uh, people tend to actively dislike those who won't conform. And of course, that's the way it works. A meta-analysis of conformity shows uh, that while uh, Americans show a great deal of conformity, people from collectivistic cultures conform even more, especially when they are conforming to their in-groups. And of course, these are military people marching. That is the end of the chapter. So I'll talk to you guys next week.